All right, Andy, tell us about this video that we're about to see. I happen to be blessed by living in an area with lots of art. And one of the artists that uh, recently had celebrated his 100th birthday uh, last year, or actually uh, that would be 2022 uh, when he celebrated his 100th birthday, is uh, uh, Leonard Baskin who uh, it was a uh, socialist and made artwork that was uh, honestly kind of inspiring to me. Uh, I, I love I love his work. He was also part of like the civil rights movement and, uh, you know, took part in a lots of like parts of history. He's, he's like one of those people who's like uh, Forrest Gump, but just showing up in uh, various parts of history. Yeah. So my understanding is that this guy, there's this gallery that's uh, right by where you live. Right. And you went yeah, over and shot a video on a basket exhibit that they have. Yeah, that they were celebrating his hundredth uh, uh, birthday, um, and and they put together a good exhibit of uh, his work. And uh, because the fact that he, you know, socialism was actually one of his inspirations, and, and kind of like the 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 basics, you know, the basis of it. Uh, even, even though uh, you know you'll hear that uh, he wasn't always a socialist uh, towards the end of his life. Mm -hmm. um, it's still like like the 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 movement uh, for people the. Um, uh, you know, uplifting workers, all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff, o always was a cons uh, constant theme with his uh, with his work. The video you're about to watch, uh, you're going to see a lot of his artwork uh, that's that's currently for sale. So if you're one of the uh, few people who watch this program that has a lot of disposable income, definitely go uh, go hang out with Andy, and he'll he'll take you for the in-person version of the tour and suggest uh, what art you should you should you should buy for your home. But anyway, with that, enjoy the video. Welcome, welcome to R. Michelson Galleries. My name is Paul Gulla. I'm the gallery manager and curator here. R. Michelson Galleries is in Northampton, Massachusetts, um, about two hours west of Boston. And we are the largest uh, commercial art gallery in Massachusetts. We've been in business for about 40 years and we have people like Leonard Baskin, we have Leonard Nimoy, we've had shows with people like Billy Dee Williams and Kurt Vonnegut. So we're pretty diverse uh, as far as the people that we carry. And welcome to our one of our current exhibits, uh, Leonard Baskin and Politics. Uh, August of 2022 would have been his 100th birthday. So uh, in celebration of that, I wanted to do something that was near and dear to his heart, which was his politics. This piece right here, Pele the Conqueror, in the late 40s, uh, Leonard was reading a lot of Marxist literature and Pele the Conqueror was the name of a novel by the Danish writer Martin Anderson Nexo um, and his great proletarian novel, uh, Pele the Conqueror, and this is the, uh, the main figure. Leonard was very much enamored of Marxist ideas in the late 40s. He had a tattoo of a hammer and sickle, and when he went into the Navy, he had to have it redone into a barbell because he figured they wouldn't let him into the Navy um, as a, as a tattoo-carrying communist. Uh, at the age of 14, he tells a story of he told his father, I want to be an artist, and the, his father said, well, you never make a living, but if that's what you want to do, you go through yeshiva education, you go through all of that, assuming that once his son learned a little something and got some book learning, that he'd be serious and he'd go on to do something else. Leonard went through the whole course of education and then said, I'm ready. I'm ready to be a, a sculptor, and his father didn't stop him, and he went on to the Duke, he did pretty well. But even though he considered himself primarily a sculptor, he was really a jack of all trades. He did woodcuts, he did watercolors, uh, printmaking, he did books, he had his own press. The Ghana Press was the, lar the longest running privately owned press in American history from 1942 until his death in, in 2000. He really stood out for the common person. Um, when traveling through Europe after World War II, he went to the French cathedrals. And, and studied a lot of the, the great French artists. And he would go into the cathedrals and see the guissants, which were the, uh, the tombs of the, the great leaders and the bishops and the patrons who built the cathedrals. And his first thought was, what about the schmoes that built it? Where's, where's their guissants? Where's their monument? And it led, where are their monuments? And it led to some of his best works in the, in the 40s and 50s, a uh, series of dead men, which were basically uh, guissants for the common man. Um, and men it was at the time, uh, up until really the, the 70s and the early 80s, it, it was all men. And uh, later in his career, however, he really focused on uh, turning his attention to the role of women. And women artists who did not get their due, and women as the ones who bore the greatest brunt of war. But one of the things that he 
liked to do was these enormous woodcuts, and nobody had done enormous woodcuts since the Renaissance. And the Hydrogen Man uh, was one of these monumental woodcuts. And it was based on 1956 uh, Castle Bravo, uh, nuclear detonation of the hydrogen bomb. And it was at that moment that he felt that the world was deforming. And, and this is, you know, the, 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 the visage of the male figure uh, standing upright, directly confronting the viewer, but deformed, you know, the, the whole shape is changing from something that's barely recognizable. And the inside is turning out. The skeletal and the nerves and the sinews and the blood vessels are there for you to see while the outside form just disintegrates. And he felt that that's what was happening, where war was causing the change of our very, of our very value system. The concept of war is something that he continued to, to talk about. Um, death satiate and exhausted. Uh, this is a death that has eaten so much it, it can't sustain itself. It can't even stand up anymore because it's so full. When Leonard talked about a subject and he wanted to work on a subject, he'd do it in a variety of media. He would, he would do some drawings, he would do some prints, working it through. And you can see here where um, the etching is very sculptural, has a lot of form, but it has this vortex feel that just sort of sucks you in. Um, and eventually it would culminate in a sculpture. And sometimes the sculpture would come first, sometimes the prints would come first, but he would circle around the idea as he, as he worked through it to see you know, how, how did he want to handle this? How did he want to tackle it? What's gonna give him the best idea? Um, and and he will, there's a standing version of this, a glutted death, which is standing uh, about to strike and it's about to topple over. Hanged Man was a motif that Leonard did over and over and over again. Um, he felt, this piece was done in the, in the 50s at the, in the wake of a lot of the lynchings that were going on uh, in the country. And for him, it was, uh, it was a potent image because you don't know if this, is, if this is a travesty, if this is a lynching. You don't know if this is a criminal who's gotten justice. You don't know if it's a suicide. Um, he doesn't say, and he never says. But what it is is a tragedy, no matter what, um, because it's an unnatural death. He felt that, that racism was pervasive, and he felt that the abolitionist movement needed to continue to be talked about. Uh, his Gahanna Press published some of the earliest uh, abolitionist tracts in the country, things that would be lost, uh, things by James Woolman, uh, John Woolman, and Samuel Sewell, uh, C.B. Brown, you know, people for whom were, you know, in the 1700s, you know, started to publish these things, and his Gahanna Press did several of them. Uh, he and Sid Kaplan, who was a professor at University of Massachusetts, and who was instrumental in helping found the, it was his grad students that really founded the African American Studies Department at the University of Massachusetts. Um, and uh, James Baldwin, who was teaching at the University of Massachusetts, uh, saw Baskin's Othello, uh, his, the book that he did, the woodcuts he did for it, and was very moved by it. So they had planned to do a project together. And, um, and Baldwin died before they could complete it, but he turned it into a, a, a tribute with portraits of Baldwin and unpublished poems. Uh, and David Baldwin, Baldwin's brother, uh, helped compile the poems and came out as his book, Gypsy. Um, but, uh, but images of, um, of social justice uh, were, were something that was dear to his heart. And, and I think you see it over and over and over again in his work. He did several uh, in bronze. This is the, the smallest, but he did several large hanged figures. In the mid 60s, he was asked to do some drawings for a guidebook at the site of the Little Bighorn uh, at Custer, which was then Custer Battlefield, now Bighorn National Park. And as he was researching it, he realized that he detested Custer and Reno and the Union generals and, and the genocide that they were perpetrating on the Native American peoples, but gained an enormous respect for the Plains Indians. And so he did a whole series in the 70s and continued on through, um, through, the, through the end of his career to, to do Native American images. Um, you know, and they're all individuals. They're all taking up the whole page. They're all looking at you, um, interacting with the viewer. Uh, with the four, and their names oftentimes are right on the images, you know, uh, confronting you with the force of their personalities. Um, and he did a few, he only did a few sculptures. Um, this is one of, I think, uh, three bronzes that he did in the, in the Native American series. One of Baskin's major commissions was the FDR Presidential Memorial in D.C. He was, 
He was commissioned to do it. Um, Leonard said it was the, the first president he ever voted for and the only one he voted for who ever won. Uh, he thought it was one of the, he was the greatest American president. And he has pictured his cortege, his funeral cortege, even though it was not horse drawn, it was, uh, it was done in, with, with cars. He just felt, and the mourners didn't come from behind, they were on the side of the road. He just felt he wanted to portray him as a man of the people is people just following along distraught, you know, almost aimless, just following the casket. He did a number of studies based on the memorial, and right now it's the 25th anniversary of the memorial. Um, you can go down and see it. He was uh, the last room, the last term of office in this funeral cortege, but it just shows his devotion, I think, to, uh, to FDR's focus on you know, the, the, common, the common person. This piece is called First Inaugural, and it was when FDR states, you know, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Baskin felt that this, res this resonated and echoed as, his, as one of his biggest messages. Um, this was originally intended to be one of the sculptures in the memorial, uh, but it was very powerful and they felt it was, it was too powerful for a general audience. Um, and uh, they inevitably rejected it, uh, although it did become uh, one of Leonard's favorites. Um, and you can see here, here's, here's the model of the, uh, of the proposed sculpture. And it would have been, um, it would have been fairly large. You know, it would have been, you know, probably about uh, five or six feet tall. And this is Baskin's Monument to Labor. Um, it's based on a French sculptor's Jules Dalou's unfinished Monument to Labor. Uh, Jules had traveled all over France to represent every single form of labor in France. And he did small little clay sculptures of uh, accountants and ditch diggers and plumbers and craftspeople. Um, and, and it was a multi-year project and it was going to be enormous. And the, in the center of it was this uh, sort of pyramid shaped structure. Um, and he never finished it. They ended up casting his clay pieces into, into bronze after his death. Leonard did this as a tribute to him and to his labor movement. I would get people in, you know, that would come into the gallery and I'd introduce them to Baskin. They'd be like, this is great. This guy's fantastic. How come I've never seen him before? And we'd go through all the work. And then they'd come back a year later. Sometimes people come every year. And they'd say, you know, remember how I, I told you I never heard of Leonard Baskin? I don't know how I missed him. He's everywhere. I mean, I mean, my Haganah, and there's a poster in my library, and there's a sculpture, you know, in the place, the museum that we like to go. He said, you know, once I noticed his work, he was everywhere, you know, and, and he is, he, he's pervasive, you know, he's, he, he sort of managed to get himself into, into everything uh, expertly. Well, thanks for coming with us to, uh, to see our Michelson Galleries. Uh, come visit. We're in the heart of North, downtown Northampton. It's an old, 100-year-old bank building. Uh, right in the middle of the town or on our website rmichelson.com and what you've seen is just the tip of the iceberg so come down and say hello. watching free public content from Give Them an Argument to access every single episode of the show, the main show on uh, Monday nights, all of the streams, all of the uh, debate breakdowns, all of the patron exclusive post games on Monday nights, all of the patron exclusive bonus episodes every week, and much, much more. Go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. I cannot resist ending this with, don't be foolish.